Welcome, everyone. Glad everyone's here. Um, we're going to talk about a work that's currently on view at Franklin Street Works, uh, Dennis Cleveland. It's an opera by Michael Rouse, who I was calling Mikkel Rouse for about two months because I didn't know any better. <laughs> um, and uh, it it's based on, or it sort of uses the structure of a television talk show like Jerry Springer or Maury Povich. Um, so I thought it would be really fun to have sort of an interdisciplinary conversation about the work and have Michael here and have uh, another composer and music critic, Kyle Gant. Your last name is Gan, right? I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Um, and uh, Barbara Alfano White, who worked in television and actually worked on the Sally Jesse Raphael show, which is a talk show and worked on um, the Maury show, correct? Yes. As far as, and she's done a lot more than that, but those are her talk shows that she's done. Yeah, Sally, Maury, and uh, Maury Noah Boyle. If anybody remembers her, she was on Extra. Anyway. Yeah. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about the opera from these intersectional points of view, as well as contemporary art and the exhibition that's up right now. Um, so, uh, so the process here is we're going to play a clip that everyone picked a clip except for Michael. He's, su he's su being surprised. Like this is your life kind of thing. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to play a clip and talk about it. And hey, y'all. Um, and then uh, we'll talk to around eight, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions and conversation. Um, I think the best thing is for y'all to jot down things you're thinking and ask us after versus us getting totally derailed. At least the first, like, let's do that the first 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll see how we feel. Does that sound good? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to read a little bit about each person on the panel so you know who they are. Um, Kyle Gann is a, com that's this person, um, is a composer and a new music critic for, he was, he is a composer and a new music critic for the Village Voice from 1986 to 2005. Um, since 1997, he's taught at Bard, Bard College. He's the author of seven books on American music, including books on uh, Conlon, Nancaro, Robert Ashley, John Cage's Four Minutes, 33 Seconds, and Charles Ives' Concord Sonata. He studied composition with Ben Johnston, Morton Feldman, and Peter Genna, and much of his music is microtonal. His major works include the Piano Concerto, Sunken City, Transcendental Sonnets for Chorus and Orchestra, the microtonal music theater piece, Custer and Sitting Bull, the Planets for Mixed Octet, and Hyperchromatica, yeah, um, for three re retune retuned piano-driven pianos. I love that phrase. Um, his music. The computer-driven. Oh, it is. <laughs> oh, oh. I either have a typo I, here. I fixed it on my website after you. Oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't my fault. Good. I'm almost glad it's not me. Well, thank okay. You for you. Um, <laughs> His music is available on the New Albion, New World, cult. I, I like it, I like the typo though. Anyway, uh, Lovely Music, Mode, Other Minds, Meyer Media, New Tone, Microfest, and Monroe Street Labels. Um, Michael Rouse is a New York-based composer, director, performer, and recording artist hailed as a composer many believe to be the best of his generation, New York Times. His, work inclu his works include 31 records, seven films, including funding and music for minorities, and a trilogy of media operas, Failing Kansas, Dennis Cleveland, and The End of Cinematics. His work has frequently appeared on top 10 lists around the country. He's received commissions from the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the Mary Flagler uh, Carey Charitable Trust and the Meet the Composer Reader Digest Commissioning Program. Rouse's composi compositions have been performed at Lincoln Center, the New York State Theater, the, and Alice Tully Hall, and throughout the United States and Europe. Uh, more information, can, you can get it at his website, uh, michaelrouse.com. And his music's on iTunes. Um, Barbara Alfano White, am I pronouncing your middle? Like, yes. oh, yeah, good. Um, has been an award winning producer for a number of syndicated television programs, such as Sally Jesse Raphael, Maury Povich, and in person with Maureen O'Boyle. Barbara's specialty is field producing, where she crafted stories on video to introduce guests on the show. 
She worked on all aspects of the talk show format from pre-production to final editing. She was executive producer for Banyan Productions reality program, A Wedding Story. Barbara is a seasoned professional who has most recently become an elementary school media specialist and summer camp director. Um, so welcome everyone. I mean, I'm Terry Smith, I'm a creative director. I think most of you know me, so I'm not gonna bore you with my bio. Um, okay, um, all right, so I'm gonna start with the clip, I think it's my clip. Yep, <coughs> your clip. Will surely grow. Animate motive to find stories that you ought to know. Thank you. And why are you here today? There's got to be someplace else. I keep to myself for the most part, but I guess I'm here for the stories because there's nowhere else to go. It feels that way anyway. And where would you go? I have no idea. Do you think much about death? All the time. It's the only thing that keeps me away from the TV. And you know how I feel about television. Oh, for sure. I mean, my friends have always thought I was over the top with the television, but there have been times when television was the only thing left. Television never lets you down sort of thing. Television as collective memory. Mm, thank you. Which conveniently brings us to the topic of today's show. It's Memory Day today on Dennis Cleveland. We'll be talking to our guests and our audience members about their most intimate and personal memories. Let's bring that up. So, I, yay, I know, it's amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, part of this was because of the exhibition I curated was, was thinking about like um, escapism as a way, to, as a sort of dampener to make us feel better about our hierarchy in the world and our place in, in society and like our dreams that have or have not come true. Um, but I, the part about the mortality and the part about, about death is the only thing that keeps me from watching more television. You know, that idea really just kind of hung there. And then that also the idea of it never letting you down. Um, which I think, you know, a lot of our habit energies, as Buddhists would say, like, are, you know, are things that just kind of we get attached to because we feel like they, it could be shopping, it could be a bottle of wine, it could be television, but, um, so anyway, so those were the things that made me think about it, or made me want to show that clip, plus I liked that it introduced the idea of memory day, and also the idea of television as collective memory, and so I feel like we're not only hearing the memories of the people in the audience, but television's also a character in it. It sort of introduces television as one of the pe people in a way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thoughts? <laughs> just looking at, at the format, it looks just like a talk show, right? I mean, that's one of the things that I think was captured so perfectly well. Like, you know, what you're talking about, just the way you're dressed as a talk show host and, um, when you're talking about people who need, who really were looking at talk shows as an escape, as a way to um, appointment viewing, they back then there was no internet or anything else, any other way to to watch something except at 10 o'clock you were there and you watched it. So um, it it really was uh, a, like a cult, you know, uh, that time, that era. Is that a term, appointment <laughs> viewing? Yeah. Uh -huh. a great term. Appointment I mean, viewing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it. now you can watch anything anytime on multiple devices, right. but there was an audience that, you know, you, you never missed that show. You watched it at 10 o'clock or 4 o'clock or whenever it, whenever it aired. Well, a, a big part of Dennis Cleveland would not have happened if I hadn't met this gentleman because <clears throat> beyond his incredible insights to music, his critical writing and, and his compositions, he was also, I believe, the guy that turned me on to Voltaire's Bastards, mm -hmm. the John Ralston Saul book. In fact, in Kyle's music column, which was theoretically a music column only, um, he actually did an entire article or piece on Voltaire's Bastards, which I think had a big influence on a lot of composers. Certainly did me. <clears throat> I used to buy a copy of that every couple of weeks and give it to somebody new. So. And he probably gave it to me because I was too probably too cheap to buy it, but, but uh, it was transformative. I mean, I ended up becoming really good friends with, with 
with John Saul, and he came to the premiere of Dennis Cleveland. But, but uh, the point of this is that he talked about a lot of things about television and ritual, and the repetitive, the repetitive ritual of television. And that that to me was hugely instrumental in figuring out that I would actually stage the piece as a talk show. Like I knew it was going to be about television. I was six months into writing the music. I knew it was going to be about media, but I didn't. It was sort of a eureka moment that probably wouldn't have happened if Kyle hadn't introduced me to that book. And that the, the convention uh, of Memory Day, I think, is, is sort of part of that fabric that pretends um, that something will happen, like on a talk show, but actually nothing is going to happen. And that, for me, was, a, as we talked about earlier, that for me was a real connection between the kind of non-narrative theater and music that I was so influenced by in the early days of New York. The idea that there was a medium that was reaching millions and millions of people that didn't actually have to have a narrative. I mean, they would say a narrative, you know, it's uh, whose baby is this guy's <laughs> or something like that. But, but really, there's no narrative other than the fact that sort of lots of things continue to happen over the course of an hour. And that just seemed to me completely ripe for a large-scale musical structure piece that would look a little bit like a, a three-ring circus, which at the time, in uh, 94, 95, 96, that's, what the talk, that's kind of how the talk shows were, were behaving. Yeah. They didn't start that way, but they certainly evolved. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were, I was, <clears throat> had been talking to Michael earlier about how seeing the video again, I hadn't seen the piece since 2002, and it made me so aware of how many things had changed, and I just realized I'm looking at a pre-internet world here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of hard to get your head around. Yeah. Very, very different. Yeah. So, and also, I, I saw it at least twice live, maybe three times. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was, it was an incredible breaking down of the fourth wall, because I remember especially when I saw it at the John Jay Theater, one of the singers was sitting next to me, and I had no idea. And so Michael just walk, suddenly walks up and puts, sticks a microphone in her face. I'm, I'm going like this. You already seen it. Yeah. Yes, but so you, you yeah, but I think I hadn't sat one next ah. next to one of the singers before. Okay. So the people just popping up around you in the audience and, and bursting into story or song or something, and you have no idea who who's who. Well, and it was you know you, you get. A, I, you start think, geez, if he sticks the microphone in my face, what am I going to say? And, <laughs> and curiously, and that's interesting that he's saying this because he he not only knew the convention of the piece, but had this, seen the piece at least once or twice before Lincoln Center. There were always people who thought that would happen. Yeah, they thought that it looked like such a three ring circus, and it's it's so structured right down to the second. Mm. But it always made me kind of proud that people thought. There was always the possibility. I mean, people would come up. I had my speech ready. I had my entire, <laughs> my entire thing I was going to say. I had it ready to go. And I always kind of thought that, I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I probably have the wrong idea of what is important and not important in life. <laughs> but I always kind of held that as a barometer of something that was interesting because it, something so structured could look so completely freewheeling every second. I mean, I think that's really five years of prep before you even get to a stage, right. you know. So I knew, I knew it like the back of my hand, and I had, I had codes for all the performers, you know. A, a pat here would mean speed up, a pat somewhere else would mean slow down. There were just all sorts of different ways that we had ways to kind of communicate, because a lot, a lot of the people, especially the audience members, didn't read music. So they weren't going to be able to do the timing. So that I just had to kind of know it back and forwards to make sure that was going to happen. Wow. Yeah, and in a real talk show, obviously the, the same. There's so much pre-production. There's so much setup. There's so much um, just getting the audience prepared for the show. There was a person who warmed up the show. I mean, I don't know. Has anyone here been to a talk show? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, person tells you what to do. There's, you know, clap here. Um, it it is structured, but it but the audience is such an important part of the show. Yep. If you don't have a great audience, if you don't have a great audience who's interacting with the guests on the panel, um, you know, the show just, it's not, it, it, it doesn't have the same impact. And as we spoke yeah. earlier, uh, you know, we had that. We had audience prompters. You know, Dennis Cleveland would come out very right. casually and 
tell you what the show is going to be about and then turn it over to the audience prompters and then they would uh, they would basically tell everybody how the show's going to run down and rehearse them and get them to applaud and do all this stuff, which, again, having gone to a, a ton of talk shows doing research for this piece, is not a, a, an unwarranted thing to do if you're going to a talk show. But if you're coming to a theater performance or an opera, that's not really what you think you're, you're, you're walking into. You're not walking into the idea that you're going to be under relentless television studio lighting, you're going to be part of the show, and you're going to be asked to participate constantly. And, and, and that was also part of the, 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 the concept for me was, why do we agree to do things because someone tells us to? And I always thought that that was a big part of the piece, was that the audience response, actually some of the musical structure is built around when audiences are told to applaud so it kind of lifts the music in a way and if that didn't work the music didn't work as well for me on a on a particular performance or a particular night but when it did and I think people don't know that this psychologically I always thought that was kind of the hidden trick of the music in all of my pieces but when they participated and the music sort of swelled at a certain point they were actually I mean, they were kind of part of the music, and it, they became part of the whole the whole environment in a, I think, in a really really interesting way. Right. This is Barb's. Um, we'll look at two clips that Barb <laughs> selected, and then we'll look at one Kyle selected. just turned 20 and some type of alarm should be going off but it isn't we make a date for breakfast and this is my favorite time to meet people when I show up her legs are so long that they pour out of the booth and onto the floor and an alarm should be going off but it isn't the mornings I've spent in this coffee shop meeting people we chat and make a date for that evening. And as we say goodbye, I tell her she's fun to look at. I take her to my favorite bar, which is a slightly redone version of the original bar. And she mistakes the Rolling Stones for a more recent aberration. <laughs> and an alarm. <laughs> we wind up back in my place after a brief stop. Back at home, and uh, I don't even know how the topic comes up, but somehow it surfaces that she's a virgin. <laughs> and we, we both have a great laugh about this until I realize that she's not joking. Now, like most great American myths that I haven't bought into, this virgin idea is no great shake. Only now, I'm starting to feel anxious and I couldn't have known why. But what happened next is remarkable. Her parents want to meet me. Now, I never even did anything like that when I was her age, but it's clear that this isn't an unreasonable idea. And besides, her parents are very progressive, and they're also very loaded. <laughs> they own their own building. I, I think they made their fortune from being on the ground floor of some fossil fuel development. And anyway, like I said, they're very liberal, but in that New, New York, York way, way that you can't totally trust. 
it, it, it's, oh, it's only on the day that we're supposed to meet that I find out that they're leaving town for the weekend and are expecting that the deflowering of their daughter will take place on the premises. Oh, all they expect is to meet me and make sure I'm not some madman from Missouri. All in all, pretty progressive. I'd say that's very progressive. So what would compel somebody to come on, uh, you know, national television and, and, and spill their guts and talk about things like this? Um, that was the whole basis for the talk show culture. Um, you know, this is 1990, so some of these topics were just still, you know, shocking. And, and I think I selected this clip only because I think you're... You know, you're listening to just somebody, just, just you know, it could be your neighbor, it could be anybody, and that's, you know, coming on TV talking about things that you probably want to talk about, but you could never talk about to anyone. So, finally, there was a format where people could discuss things that were borderline, you know, just, just enough, um, you know, scary and and salacious or whatever, and and so. The talk show became the forum for that, and it kept getting, the line kept getting crossed more and more. You know, it's like, okay, well, we've talked about this. Now what are we going to talk about? Now where are we going to go from here? And he talks about living in the moment. It's just, that is, the, that's basically what it is. You know, what's, what's bothering me today? What am I, what do I need to talk about today? What's, you know, the living for the moment part I thought was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the confessional nature, I think I mentioned to you guys when we were talking earlier that when we first premiered this at the kitchen in, uh, in the fall of 1996, the Jenny Jones trial was going on. Yeah. And I had a friend, <laughs> I had a friend because of the topical nature of the show, and again, remembering this is pre-internet, was sending me faxes to the kitchen, like to the kitchen, giving, <laughs> giving me updates on the Jenny Jones trial. <laughs> As if that was sort of like a have a great opening night kind of thing. But it really was amazing. It was like this real, it doesn't sound like anything now because we have YouTube and Instagram and the internet and instant access. But this idea that I was sort of ensconced in this small cave called the kitchen and we were making this piece and, and I was getting these faxes fed to me keeping me informed of this thing. And I didn't care about this thing, but he thought it was so connected to what I was doing. And it was a really, uh, it's hard to describe it. It was a really interesting moment about why do people talk about this kind of stuff and why th they can't tell this to their, their lover or their, their husband or their wife, but they would tell it to a million people. Strangers, what, yeah. what is it about that format, you know? And, and again, I, I, I hate to keep harping on going back to John Ross and Saul, but the idea of the repetitive ritual of television and the fact that that became kind of a, uh, as you said, uh, what was the term again? God, I love Appointment it. viewing. Appointment <laughs> viewing. That, that, the fact that that's kind of your church. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of where you're going, you know, not necessarily looking for a narrative story, but looking for, I, I think it was much more complicated than like, a lot of people told me when they saw the show, they thought, yeah, I understand why this is interesting to you because, you know, you look at the salacious natures of the shows and you, think, and you feel better about yourself. Thank God that's not me. Right. But I don't really think it was that. I think it was something much more profound. I think it was, it was much more about that repetitive ritual that, that no different than your regular cup of coffee in the morning. It kind of grounds you while you're being surrounded by a planet sort of spinning out of control through the universe. And, and so I wasn't, you know, everybody thought this was going to be like a big goof piece, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it is a lot of fun and it is entertaining, but, but it, but for me, it really was about big ideas, you know, ideas about, about, you know, like what connects us all and, and how this thing, even if it was somewhat at times lamentable, <laughs> you know, why was this why was this thing connecting us, you know, through video? And now, I mean, you could take it obviously one step further and why is, why is the internet and YouTube and all the other things connecting us in a similar way? And how much of it is entertainment and how much of it is, you know, I mean, it's, uh, truth is stranger than fiction in many ways. Like you just um, cross that line all the time. Yeah. 
Can we talk about your, your lyrics in this a little bit? Because I'm blown away by the, the lyrics in, well, in, in, the, in the songs. And like, like paraphrase to death comes up a lot. Like, yeah. Because like, you know, when I was watching the clips, I almost started getting confused because I'm like, wait, is this the same clip? Because there's repeated things that go throughout the whole. And you're thinking about the re repetitive nature of television. Yeah. Was that sort of a meta version of that in your, in your I mind? So, or? I mean, that clip started, we kind of ended with... Uh, with uh, the guy saying, uh, he, he tells a story that, that, that that's a longer 17 minute piece called, of which that monologue comes from, called Soul Train. And uh, in, the, in the first section, the guy, Dennis Cleveland, tells a story, and then that confession happens and a couple other things happen, and then that story is retold, but it's reharmonized. So the first time it happens, it's kind of a very dark uh, sound, uh, a, a dark kind of harmonic uh, language, and then it's a much, uh, shall we say, brighter, more hopeful harmonic language at the end of the piece, because Dennis Cleveland, in a way, at least in my non-narrative head, discovers who he might be or who he could be in this in this sort of manipulative environment. And um, um, I was I was actually thinking about th th there's some of my favorite lyrics in the piece, but now I'm trying to remember what they are. Um, but uh, he, uh, create a throne. He, yeah, he's yeah. like uh, he's like uh, uh, set out for destiny, a place where all ends meet. We got some of the car. He went down the road. And she said, "Baby, can't you see that our meeting wasn't chance? That by sitting on this road, yeah. you were waiting for this dance. And the power of suggestion in this moment, on this day, is the way we make religion. Right. Is how we make up how to pray." Who'd have thought I'd find a meeting on the road all alone? Think a group of lonely people, create a king, create a throne. And I thought that, again, getting back to the, the, the Saul idea of, of that ritual nature of TV, for me, that was a very, I was very proud of that lyric. And I thought that, that you know, to, not only to have that and have it in this sort of choral canon of Soul Train, but also to have it staged in a talk show environment which should be low, low brow, shall we say? Uh, there was just something about that to me that was like one of the high points of my life, which is like, I'm really proud of that moment, that, that something like that's being stated, but it's being stated in a way that is uh, in, in a format that's theoretically for the common man. And I guess in a weird way, I was really happy that I wasn't talking down to that. I was saying, this is, worthy of elevation, this is worthy of maybe making an idea. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. you did it. Ah. Yeah. In my humble opinion. Good on me. Yay! <laughs> um, any other thoughts for this? Okay, we'll do, okay. Barb's the next clip. Why are you here today? There's gotta be someplace else. A person you trust, a person you love, a person you're vulnerable with. You have been with Michael for four years. How did you get back together again? A person you trust, a person you're close to, a person you're vulnerable with. You knew this is the woman that you love. Do you want to marry her? A person you trust, a person you're close to, a person you're vulnerable with. She feels that you let her down, though. She feels that you let her down, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She feels like she gave you so much. She feels like she gave you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She feels that you let her down, though. She feels like she gave you so much.
so I selected this clip for, well, first of all, it's, it's brilliant. It's beautifully done. The, the, uh, the, the guests are, are really taking over the show in this point and, and are so important. They're, they're, um, they're deciding, you know, that this guy isn't good for this other person. I mean, this is all happening, and, and Dennis's reactions are just classic. I just love the way that he's all buttoned up in this nice suit, and he's just looking and not and just sort of the judge the judge of this all this this um, these antics going on and um, I were like I, I don't even know if people know Sally Jesse Raphael do they know do you guys know her I do here's a sweatshirt she was the one who wore the red glasses but she she we would have classic Sally poses and it would either be like this or they would be you know the tissue shot or you know she she, she started to take this other role where she would just um, stand back and let the let the let the show go on, and um, the reaction shots of her really made everybody just it, it it was so brilliantly done. I thought you captured that really well because you just um, they started to just take control and, and make decisions and say I'm you know I'm done with this guy I'm he's out of here and that kind of thing happened quite often. Yeah. It, it also, it might be apparent that, uh, or maybe it wouldn't occur to you that a, that a lot of the things the panelists are saying were actual recordings of things from talk shows, that's, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, he, he recorded hundreds and hundreds of hours of this thing, and he would take these snippets and have people read them with the tape until they until they were exactly mimic, mimicking what they had gotten out of the studio, which is kind of an idea that goes back through new music to Steve Reich's different trains yep. and come out. Um, and a few other, but, but I, this is the first time in a vernacular context like this, yeah. I yeah. think. And so there's this kind of bedrock of you're actually hearing the de effluvia of other talk shows mm -hmm. Coming through this, yeah, things, a, things that the, some other people up there had said. Yeah, there's a lot of sampling that came from talk shows. There's a there's a uh, a section or a track called "Life in These United States" mm -hmm. that is all from. It's just a counterpoint of different talk show samples. Uh, then, but the, the the talk a lot of the talk show samples had a lilt, a harmonic lilt to them. So once I kind of found the pitch centers or whatever. I could actually harmonize them, so then they came. They became very sort of chorus-like, and and uh, but that's that's one of them. That particular one was from the as the Richard Bay show, uh, which was a, a one of my favorite shows yeah. like of all time. It was uh, as I was telling these guys when we had a phone conference earlier. Like I would call my friends when I, I was so obsessed when I was making this piece, and I'd call my friends, you know, respectable artists and different people, different walks of life. I say, what are you doing right now? And they go, well, I'm working. And I go, could you turn on WOR TV right now, Channel 9? And they go, no, because they'd heard me do this like a No. <laughs> I go, just, I will never ask you, but just this one time, yeah. he's got someone on the wheel of torture, and they're throwing food on him, and it's just really <laughs> something you should see. And it was like, like you know, the, for me, the big part of this was that performance art was like, you know, Karen Finley was doing stuff for 250 people at the kitchen, but Richard Bay was doing it for 2 million people. And you might say, well, yeah, but the context of that is completely different. But I'm not so sure. There was something about that to me that was performance art, and it was really, really profound in this very bizarre way of where, you know, American culture was going. And I was, you know, just glued into it. So that was a big part of... Yeah. where a lot of the samples and stuff came from, from various pieces. So when you say the sampling, just so, because, so the music that's playing that behind the people that we're seeing singing actually had voices from well, the... Well, the music is integrated, actually, into uh -huh. the samples. But, you know, like that, he's out of there, I want him gone, he's out of there. A, a woman said that on a talk show. Okay, okay. Or, you know, you have been with Michael for four years. How'd you get back together again? That's a rhythm that I didn't create. That's a rhythm that I found Richard, I found Richard <coughs> Bay to have a lilt, like a musical lilt that you could, you could take. There's a lot of speech patterns all over the world that their, their actual speech patterns have a huge musicality. So to, to grab these samples and, I mean, the harder thing actually was that because I had to, I felt like I had to create a talk show environment that was believable, mm -hmm. 
even if there was com very complex rhythmic stuff, I felt like it still ha had to be grounded in 4-4. Four, four. Like it had to be grounded into a beat because all the talk shows I went to had, had you know, surface background music that was in a 4-4 four, four beat. And that was actually harder than if I could have just been free form and taken the voices and mm -hmm. done stuff with them. Mm -hmm. But I had to find a way to, you know, um, f make that kind of all work. Uh, I think life, life in these United States, it works incredibly well. There's certain sections I think that work incredibly well. Yeah. Yeah. So. And the performers, I mean, these performers are regular people in the talk shows. I mean, I actually did have to find a um, uh, one of the husbands. I think it was a cheating husband show or so, and uh, um, had to find a storefront in New York City where where a man had to wear a red bra. I mean, it's really exactly like that. He had to dance in front of the uh, uh, as some kind of punishment. Um, and you know these are regular normal people, right? And have to perform, and they they did it, yeah. and they like to do it. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it is entertainment, but it was also kind of a fun. Yeah, always had that fun element to it, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I <clears throat> I was working at the Village Voice at the time, and <clears throat> I got to tell you, we had somebody on staff at the Village Voice worked in the print shop or something. Uh, real macho gay guy whose hobby was going on talk shows and lying. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and he would like he would like go on and claim that he was a 39-year-old virgin who just hadn't met the right girl yet. <laughs> <laughs> and he would just make up all these stories. <laughs> Quite sure. <laughs> so he kind of made it a performance art. Yeah. Yes. Thing. Wow. Um <laughs> funny. Can you talk about the, I don't know if you call them captions or the, because you mentioned that the Met, they had just started using those. Yeah, like, what role, like, what role does that play? Well, or, when, I, um, when I was working on the piece, I guess I was like six months into the music and I knew it was going to be a piece about media and about television and I had done stage drawings, all sorts of bizarre things that didn't make much sense, but I thought they were kind of beautiful. Full court basketball to acquire, like all sorts of things that I thought what this would be. And then I was walking through Central Park about six months in, and I just stopped in my tracks and I said, it's, it's not about television, it is television. And that's when I got the idea to stage it. And I thought, this breaks down the fourth wall in a really remarkable way. It acknowledges pop culture, which is a big part of my life. And it even solves the, the weighty issue, hard to believe in the times we're living now, but at that moment in time, it was a big deal that the Met was going to do subtitles and that is this a dumbing down of society that in order to bring people into opera in German or Italian they would be subtitles and I thought oh this is amazing the television rollovers can be the subtitles for the libretto so it's just one of those great moments that doesn't happen very often where just every problem I had was kind of solved the minute I came up with the staging idea and that was a really you know, it's a good moment when you can just barely, I was just shivering. I was standing there. I thought I was going to pee all over myself. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what to do. I thought, this is it. This is it. And I guess the great thing about being alive and having those moments occasionally is that then it spurs you on to do it, you know, because I was already so much in debt from this piece or whatever. Are you really going to keep going? And I thought, okay, I'll keep going. This, was, <laughs> this is an idea worth pursuing. Great. All right, so this is Kyle, Kyle's um, clip. I was dating this older man, a lot of money, great linguistic skills, and he um, tried to do something a little weird. This is kind of personal. Well, anyway, I lost my balance and broke my wrist. And why do men want to do that? Now I've got a broken wrist. And where is Mr. Wonderful? Oh, he's out of there. I wanted him gone. He's out of there. And why do people do that? They move on, I guess. Nothing's permanent. Well, anyway, it's all just grist for the mill, so to speak. And permanence, a sense of belonging? That's not for me to say, but I'm fine. At this stage of my life, I'm quite happy. And you have who to thank? Uh, the culture, I guess. Celebrities. All the time? Celebrities, all the time. I just find it comforting to borrow images, other people's images. I have my picture on my credit cards.
This scene uh, occurs a little less than halfway through the opera, and this is, for me, the, the point at which everything kind of lifts up and takes off. Every, the stuff before this, the, uh, the quotes in Life in the United States are actual quotations from other shows. The stories they tell are the kinds of stories that people tell on talk shows. There's a kind of level of reality there. But at this point, it kind of, it's all starts to turn into metaphor. And I, I am a great believer in, in art as metaphor. And it's also the first time at which the people on the stage who you know are actors start talking to the people in the audience who you may not have known were, were actors. And they start, they begin this dialogue between them and it's not really a dialogue because they're saying the same thing. There's kind of a linear continuity going back and between different voices. And it's also the lyrics at this point, this time the finger that I put into the pie is gonna be a gold retriever, not just pointing at the sky. Everything is this time, this time, this time. And it's, there's an ambiguity you can't, Sometimes you think this is the moment at which they're going to break out of this celebrity worshiping system and do something else, or it's the time that they are going to reach their own personal transformation as people try to do on talk shows, or 
it can also be this time the murders that you worship from afar are going to join you in the bedroom, maybe meet you at the bar. This may be the time when everything all backfires on you <laughs> and you can't escape it anymore. So there's this tremendous ambiguity. It's all, it's all very emotionally focused, but you can't quite tell where, this, where the emotion is going. And I find, I mean, there's an emotion hanging over all of your, I mean, there's an ambiguity hanging over all of your pieces because it, it's so, I like listening to, about Michael's music, so often you can, you can identify very carefully what you're hearing at the moment, but when you try to put the whole piece together, it's just, you can't quite make, make all the parts fit. So, and it does have something to do, has a lot to do with the lyrics. And the way they get each song seems to give a different picture of the piece somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lyrics, yeah, really love beautiful lyrics. Um, when just relating it back to the, the exhibition that the piece is in, it really adds to the sh a nice aspect of it. At, that This aspect adds a nice bit because Katie Noland, who uh, was the artist who sort of her writing about American dissatisfaction sort of became the lens for me curating the show. Um, she talked about a celebrity a lot and how, how we trash celebrities to make ourselves feel better. But she also talked about the honorific death of the celebrity and like a celebrity, like James Dean getting it. I don't know if she talked about him, but the, the idea of like a famous person driving too fast and getting in a car wreck and dying and that there's this sort of like, um, fascination with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like when, you know, hearing, um, you know, the beautiful murder celebrity all the time, like it just really made me think a lot about like the sort of under, underbelly side of American life and the sort of dark, dark poetic sense that she would talk, she kind of brought to thinking about this thing. Yeah, and Saul talked about that a lot in Voltaire's Bastards. And that's where, I mean, actually the, the title Beautiful Murders com comes from a, a term uh, that he made that basically describes the same thing you're talking about is this sort of this sort of uh, idea of like using your example James Dean and how we sort of frame these beautiful murders or these beautiful deaths or whatever in a celebrity culture that that we somehow have a connection to whether we whether we really do or not but that's kind of what he was referring to there and I thought you know there are some things I wonder about 20 years later about the talk show format, uh, even though I have no regrets that I did it this way. But I am actually pretty happy with the fact, or sad, uh, with the fact that so many of the things lyrically that are talked about in the piece are just, or is bad or not, if not worse today, yeah. in terms of celebrity culture and in terms of what's, you know, what's occupying our face time, you know, with our phones and with what we're doing. And I think that that to me was, I never wanted to tell people they should or shouldn't think this way, but I like the idea that by presenting it in the talk show format, it was a way for them to say, well, why did I agree to just applaud right. when someone told me to applaud? And why did I agree to do this and do that? So that people could kind of maybe make their own decisions about, about their, you know, their participation in this culture. And I feel like even now, it's so much harder, even for me. Like I did, I did a couple of pieces based on television, Dennis Cleveland, <clears throat> talk show opera, a piece about channel surfing and stuff. And I was addicted to television my entire life, but I thought like Rauschenberg, I was getting something out of it. And then in like 2011, I said, I don't think I have another television thing in me. And I got rid of it. I just let it go and, and cut the cord as, as, the, as the kids say. And I haven't missed it. You know, I haven't, I, ha I don't feel like there's anything I'm missing, but on the flip side of that is that the, the connection to the internet and the connection to, you know, 24 new, 24, you know, cycle news all the time and everything, it's like, I'm still kind of a victim of it. And I have to actually, like the programmers who won't let their kids have too much screen time, I actually have to kind of have these boundaries so that this doesn't become, I want to be in control of this technology. I don't want it to control me. Yeah. So I have to, but I have to set boundaries like everybody else. Otherwise, you know, it's like I'll eat, I'll eat like three buckets of chicken wings. You know? <laughs> and I mean, I, we're not supposed to do that. So we're, I think we're not supposed to be in front of our phones every second either, but yeah. that's just me. Yeah. You know? 
I think I think also um, what Kyle touched upon the you know the dark side of going um, to the point of what happens after the shows these shows um, you know these people come on everybody talks about topics some relevant important topics and then they go home and they live their lives and um, as you said I mean you could either gain some knowledge and maybe the experience was helpful or maybe it wasn't maybe not at all you know maybe maybe things are even worse so um, that's that in itself was always something that was um, on everybody's mind you know um, should we be contacting people after the show and, and I think like a show like Dr. Phil you know that he does that a lot and um, and 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 you know to their credit I think the talk show hosts do genuinely care but you're on to another show you know you've done it's over and it's, it is just a show but you know the people who lived it and experienced it you know they have to go on and um, and live their lives so hopefully it doesn't go down the the, the, the the beautiful murder part. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Yeah. <coughs> Just talk loud. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, so I think what, the you bringing up the this time, this time, this mm -hmm. time, it's really depressing and poignant and like we've all been like I mean I think everyone can kind of relate to that like at different decibels, right? Like this time I'm gonna run a little faster during this part of my run, or this time I'm not gonna blow up this relationship, or this, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's so, I don't know, it's just so like spot on and, and kind of, I think you're kind of masterful in finding the universal and the specifics, um, which is really hard to do. Mm -hmm. I, I have read that the most dangerous words in the English language are this time will be different. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> So I think I think I think we can open up to questions and comments and conversation. And I have a microphone. It's not so much so we can hear each other. It's so we have a record of it. So I'm going to go turn that one on. Who we have? Harry's going to be our host. <laughs> okay. All right. Chris. Yeah. <coughs> she looks like a talk show host. She does. She's got it. Yes. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Um, well, because I, I was wondering if this was going to turn into some sort of thing where we're actually find out we're on a talk show. <laughs> if it was, if it was that no, reflexive. I don't, I don't have time for that, Chris. But can I can I say this to that? Yeah. <laughs> Is that I'm not going to say every. We did this show all over the world over a 12 year period, and I'm not going to say it happened every time. But many times, people would come up after the show and ask when the show was going to air. <laughs> And I always felt, again, that was a really huge achievement. That, that I believe it. Yeah. Because, you know, we made it, uh, you know, somebody said, it might have been the Times, I can't remember who said it, but a, one of the reviews said it was either like this, the most innovative opera breaking down the fourth wall or the strangest talk show I've ever seen. <laughs> and I actually liked the, I liked the latter description. I thought that's an achievement. I made, you know, because there were some... I mean, again, I've talked about Richard Bay, but there were some pretty strange talk shows at that moment in, uh, in the mid-90s. Anyway, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I just had one sort of technical question and then a, and then a more of a concept question. You said that this, this was performed at the, the Met. Did I, did I hear oh, that no, right? No, Lincoln Center. It was L oh, L Lincoln Center. Yeah, Lincoln but Center, John, yeah. we use John Jay, John Jay uh, uh, College has a really wonderful performing art space that seats something like seven or 900 people. Mm -hmm. And so we had to actually figure, when we first did this piece in New York at the kitchen, the, many people don't know this uh, really, really important performing arts, avant-garde performing arts space, about 250 seats, but it was actually originally a television studio. So it was the perfect place for us to premiere this piece because we were basically kind of using a facility that was already a black box uh, potential television studio. But, but if we were gonna ever survive, and by survive I mean break even, we had to we had to figure out a way to keep that intimacy uh, with a seven to nine hundred seat audience or larger. So uh, I went to the Cranert Center for the Performing Arts and we did that, and then that was that it enabled us to bring it to John Jay. And we basically did that by getting rid of the entire proscenium stage and using as that that as rear projection for those large screens that you saw, and then uh, rock concert style putting a. Uh, 
a basically a light grid over the entire audience and then lighting the entire audience and hanging television monitors and basically creating you know sort of a large television studio within a what's normally a performing art space in terms of the the music we were he hearing there was there a pit band or was it dat playback and with Say what, again? was was there a pit a pit band was there a the music? No, no, that was all, that was all, it was all dat, dat playback uh, except for the live vocals and stuff because having gone to Geraldo and any number of talk shows and stuff, I just knew that if there were live musicians, it wouldn't feel right. It had to come through loudspeakers. It had to kind of feel like what people were either experiencing on television or believe it or not, a lot of people, you know, now people go to Broadway shows. But Broadway wasn't doing so well in the early to mid 90s and people were going to talk shows. People, if you saw tourists coming into New York, a big thing they wanted to do was go to Geraldo. So I, I needed it for, for the, the actual sonic environment to kind of be believable so it, would look, it wouldn't look like art. The, the last thing I want to ask you is, are you aware, aware of anyone who's made or who's working on like a, a, a Facebook or Instagram opera, a social media based opera? God, there's got to be a million people. I mean, it's ripe for. But you you haven't seen any in the in the in the city that none that's gone public yet. I don't know. There's all sorts of there's all sorts of interactive pieces going on. So I don't know if I've seen anything particular to Facebook. You know, but I mean, there's a lot. There's people like there, I don't know if you know the Gregory Brothers. They're, Sounds kind of familiar. They're kind of fantastic young people who are doing all sorts of things, and they've done <clears throat> they've done some things with. Um, um, YouTube and different so, sort of social media platforms that kind of highlight their music and highlight their videos. They do like auto-tune the news. I don't know if you've seen auto-tune. That, that's where, you've, of course, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have a little, little interesting thing that no one else knows except everybody in this room. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm really proud of this. This is probably why my career never took off. Tomorrow, I'm going to be uh, uh, a co-star in a Gregory Brothers video called Meet Me in the Middle, and I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to drop tomorrow on YouTube. And I play a right-wing uncle <laughs> to Michael Gregory's left-wing, he's my left-wing nephew. It, it's funny, you, so you bring up Gregory Brothers, because the, I, I, just the other day, I was watching the um, very similar theme to what the first clip you played, Terry, explored the... <laughs> the uh, uh, Omar Fast, uh, CNN can, how do you say, CNN can cat, how do you say, cat, did anyone know this clip, Omar Fast? Oh, okay. It's a CNN, it's like, it's like before the, it was, it was about 2002, it was basically CNN just cut into single words and then reassembled into okay. this eight minute monologue not monologue, but sort of eight minute speech about, about death and about being afraid to turn off the TV because as soon as the TV goes off, you have to confront the possibility of your own your own death. Oh, I have to check. The, I want to get this information from you. I have to check this out. I think you would you would enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll never forget when I saw the Gregory Brothers. I mean, they've done so many amazing things. But my nephew turned me on to Auto Tune the News Number Eight. So think about Auto Tune the News Number Eight if you haven't seen it. And it's mind blowing. Not not only because of how they edit people's speech and as they call it, songify it, and turn it into music, but also, and you would appreciate this, the multi-layers of, of, of the, the vocal writing is just, it, it, in any other context, it would be considered a great composition, except that it's funny and topical, so therefore people just look at it as really brilliant and funny and topical. But um, I don't know if you saw it, what night, I think you came to see Gravity Radio at BAM? Yeah. But I wanted, they, they always ask you to do a talk back, you know, like when you're doing a show of that scale. And so they gave me a list of people, people who've been kind enough to like my work. And, uh, and I sent them uh, auto-tune the news number eight saying, I'd, I'd like it to be the Gregory Brothers. And they wrote me back and they said, ha, 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 thank you. I, that's really funny. Now, seriously. So then I wrote them like a three paragraph essay of why I wasn't joking and why I think these guys would be brilliant. And then they wrote back all apologetic and said, oh my God, we didn't know, we were so sorry. We had no idea you were serious. <laughs> and it ended up being the best talk back out, out of every show I've done all over the world. It was the best talk back, the most fun. They did their homework, but I never expected then that they would ask me to be in a piece. So I 
I just think that they're they're great, and they you know in the world that we're living in at this particular moment, uh, young people giving you hope is a really really good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Roger. Hi. Um, were the panelists archetypes in your mind, or what was the casting of, of those people? It's a good question because we've had different casts over the years, but for me, the big thing was uh, I, didn't, I didn't want people to play act. So, I mean, this is a hard thing to describe, but a lot of the rehearsal process, I gave everybody a book by David Mamet, you know, on directing the actor. You know, I love this thing that David Mamet once said about, you know, the most interesting thing is a person trying to untie a knot in their shoe. Because, I mean, look, they're so focused when they're doing that. Like, everything goes away as you're trying to untie a knot in your shoe. And so I would just say to them, look, I, I'm not going to tell you who to be, and I want you to be outrageous, but I would really like it if you would do your research and watch some of the... I gave them shows to watch and watch these talk shows and think about how you would react in that context. Not how you would act, like, on stage, but how you would react in that context. And... You know, some people couldn't do it, and some people felt there was a lack of direction, but, but I would say 80% of the people really stepped up and thought, what a, what a great moment. Like, I get to really kind of create my character and figure out who this is. And, you know, the, the, the people on stage are important because they, the they, they had to be more musical. They had to be able to, you know, sing the, the choral parts, and, and uh, they didn't all have to read music. I definitely wanted people who... who uh, if they could bring something else to the table, if they couldn't read music, my music director helped me find ways for them to learn sort of complex har harmony parts. But the people in the audience didn't have to do so much in that sense. So they, they had a, maybe a little bit more freedom. But, but they're also really important because beyond the fact that they only have these sort of small cameo things when the talk show host comes to them, they ha actually have to stay engaged through the entire 90 minutes because they influence the five or six people around them who influence the five or six people around them. So they keep sort of the momentum. And if you're sitting next to somebody who's really excited, it's kind of hard for you to pretend like you're not excited, even if you're not. Even if you just like, I just came here to watch this. I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And we went so far with this concept that the audience members are sent out into the, in, much like the holding cells that the talk shows have, the audience members are sent out into the crowd before everybody is led into the theater, so they can just kind of circle, you know, filter about and talk about, oh, I can't believe the Dennis Cleveland shows come to Perth, Australia, and blah, 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 and just start to kind of build the buzz of what this is going to be. So like the talk shows, the piece is sort of from the very beginning to the very end kind of a constant manipulation. But I hope in the service of make, making people wonder why they participate in that manipulation. Anyone else? Do you sit? Hello. First of all, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful. Thank you guys for being here. It's awesome. Um, I guess I just wanted to say that I, I really loved how um, the, the music is really upbeat and everything's really high energy, but there's a really strong, and I don't know if this is me projecting, but there's a really strong sense of dread and hopelessness that I, I get from it. And I just wanted to know if that was... Uh, <laughs> If, if that was something you thought about before going into it, or if that was uh, something that was uh, established before, or if that's just me. Uh... Okay, so I love that question, and here's my answer. I'll never forget the feeling I had when I saw Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas, uh, and walking out of the theater, and just being so buzzed, so high, on these absolutely despicable people. And so what was the point? You know, what, why could something, you know, so vulgar and so whatever, you know, be so uplifting? And, and I think that for me, the, the thing was because something that brilliant can be made, regardless of the subject matter, regardless of what the characters were. And that was the part of the world that I would like to be part of, is that, is that, is that. And so, uh, I was telling these guys when we did a little bit of a, a conversation before this just so we'd be prepared. One of the great moments, I mean, we've done this show a lot, but 
the first time we did it was at the kitchen in 96, and uh, a woman came up to me after the performance, and it, just as you said, it's upbeat, the music's upbeat or whatever. She came up to me, and she's, she's def she looks like someone hit her with a brick. And she looks at me, and she's kind of half smiling and not smiling, and she says, and I'll never forget the quote, she said, that was the most entertaining and the most disturbing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I thought, that's my job. I think that's a really good definition. You know, I, 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 th I think sometimes Broadway is good, but sometimes it falls too close to just entertaining. I think sometimes the avant-garde comes too, you know, to be too serious, but not to sort of give you a breath. And I think because of the generation that I came up with, you know, it, there's like a way to do both. And I think that Dennis Cleveland was, was a, a pretty hyper moment where you could kind of have your cake and eat it too. Because it doesn't pull any punches. It's a disturbing world. And the celebrity culture and, and the media, uh, you know, indoctrination and all that stuff is on complete display constantly for 90 minutes. And whether you wanted to be part of it or not, you're part of it. And I think a lot of people walked away getting that. That maybe he thought, ah, I'm going to an opera, I read about it. Probably because he wrote about it, but I, <laughs> I, read, I read about it and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this. And, um, and you know, the funniest part is we had, you know, all over the world we had lots of celebrities come to it. So they either didn't read close enough that they would be on camera or, or they wanted to be part of a scene. But whatever it was, it was, uh, I, th I felt like we kind of accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> How did you uh, get the crew? Camera, the director, technical director? Well, How did that come about? That The first time we did it, it came about on my credit cards. I mean, it was just, it was just I paid for the entire thing on credit cards. Uh, and there were some places we went, you know, like when we did it, we did it as part of my trilogy at Luminato. Um, there was a film crew as part of a film school, you know, so we were very open to where we would gather people because we did a three or four camera shoot at every show. They had to know what they were doing. They had to know what they were doing. The if we could find people who had a, had, a, had a background in television, that would be great. But I also travel with a video director named Jeff Sugg, who is really, really brilliant. He's worked in television, so he knows, you know, we're switching this live. I mean, like, as we were watching this, there are moments even now that I wince because why are they on me when they should be on the singer? But keep in mind, we've never done a final edit of this, like, a, like to make a film. So what you're seeing is actually a, you know, a live, just like on a talk yeah, show, what you're seeing is a live edit with all the mistakes. And on, on that level, I think it's pretty great. You know, on, on the level of I'd like to really hype the sound better and, and do a, you know, we, we, we uh, for all the performances we did, um, I have, uh, the, it's all shot on video, right? So I have camera tapes. So not only do we do the live, the live mix, the isolated. Did, but we also have the isolated camera tapes. So, I mean, theoretically, I could go back at some point. Well, I think it worked out fine. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, all right. Very yeah. similar to thank a real you. show. I mean, like, it is similar to a real show. But like a real sense. show. But, but, it's, but here's the thing, I'm glad. I mean, here's the thing, when, you, when, I, when I was talking to Barbara earlier, uh, a couple days ago, and she was saying, blah, 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 and it was so great or whatever. Like, that means a lot to me. It means a lot to me that this guy thinks anything I write is amazing. <laughs> but given the context of this piece, for somebody in television to say that this actually looked real That's... and that she might give me a job someday in television, <laughs> she didn't really say that. <laughs> you know, that was, that, that's, yeah. that's a huge satisfaction because, you know, I did a, I, I put myself in a very painful situation, going to talk shows, doing research at universities. It can be painful. I was in the holding cells. If you're gonna to go to a talk show sometimes, you were in a holding cell for like two hours. Mm -hmm. Because, because the, we didn't talk about this, but one of the things they're doing is they're looking at people to see, is he just here to make fun? Is he really a fan? Is she really a fan? And then they seat you accordingly. Sure. And no matter how sincere I looked, and I was sincere, because I wanted to learn this stuff, they still always knew to put me in the w very back row. <laughs> <laughs> He's trouble, yeah. I got the wide shot, but it's like, how did they know? Was I, I, I really, you know, I didn't, the first time I didn't know what, the, what was going on. I thought they're gonna put Soylent Green in here and it's gonna be a problem. <laughs> but then as I got to go to them, I thought, oh, I know what they're doing, but I still, I never, they were always smarter and slicker than me in this context.
They knew what they were doing. They, they knew how to do this. No, thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for one more question, if any. We'll edit you out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd just like to make one observation. In this piece, would there be any kind of a message? Because I, I think about this very often, is that, you know, things happen in the world, and Trump and we, you know, whatever, I don't get political, we think we're in trouble, and two minutes later, you know, I'm online in this thing pops up, C.K. Simmons in trouble, celebrity in trouble, celebrity this. And it's almost as if, um, you know, the safety, our safety as citizens is on this equal par as a celebrity having a, a scandal. Yeah. You know. And then. So what's the question? Well, I mean, is, does this piece, does that sort of speak to how we're so desensitized that it's everything just seems to be on an equal level? Everything, the scales balance between something serious and a celebrity's scandal. I mean, right? it's a really, yeah. I think that, I, I mean, I think I, your point's well taken. I mean, I think, why do we care about the, what, what these celebrities do or don't do. I mean, why are they elevated to the point of our politicians? Are they elevated to the point of our politicians because our politicians have failed us? Or are they elevated to the point of our politicians because we have allowed celebrity like the Kardashians? You know, forget, back in the Dennis Cleveland day, there, you know, at least, I hate to say this, but at least celebrities were celebrities. I mean, but now it's just like you're famous for doing nothing. And so why would you be confounded if, why would one be confounded if we put that many people on a pedestal that they let us down? I mean, my dad let me down. I did, I, it doesn't affect me as much. I didn't put him on that same pedestal. So I think it's kind of this interesting moment where something amazing could, maybe I'm an eternal optimist, but something amazing could come out of this time in terms of this breakdown, in terms of where we are with the culture, in terms of you know, beyond the whole harassment issue, which I think is amazing that it's coming out and people are finally, you know, getting their act together. But on the other hand, why were you giving these people so much power? Not just males, but celebrities. You know, like, why does that matter? You know, so I do think that, that every, every, there's so many metaphors in, the, in this piece that, that have not gone away, you know, in terms of, in terms of, what I consider corporate culture, what I consider a culture that's based on, on, on uh, constantly being sort of fed by corporations. And um, I mean, sadly, that's still with us, but I don't know, maybe, maybe some of this stuff opens some people's eyes. I'd, I'd like to see it open people's eyes in a larger context than just the specific issue that we're talking about, as important as that is. Um, speaking of corporations, I forgot to thank Hampton Inn and Suites for our gratis rooms tonight. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you to the Ferguson and the Library. Yes, by the way. <laughs> and if you haven't seen the show, by the way, yes, and I, see it today. Amazing show. Definitely check it out. You did a great job curating thank you. it. Really thank beautiful. you. Thank you. Really beautiful. Um, we have some cookies in Pellegrino over there if anybody wants a little snack before you leave. And, and remember that Franklin Street Works has an amazing cafe and amazing art and amazing people. Yeah. Come down. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, panelists, for being amazing. Thank you.